also like the vision changed like we wanted to do more you know to be less like um like a bubble in pure in group thing that's like only yeah. for us you know but yeah i was okay. just saying uh, the the development um evolution of the project reminded me a lot of making records actually um But um, yeah, Roland, why don't you take us through a little bit of the development history of the game? Like, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what it takes to make a video game? How long? What's involved? How many people are on your team? Like that kind of thing. Because, I mean, just looking at this stuff, man, if we had, you know, several video game studios doing all this, doing this kind of stuff full time, you know, bringing out, you know, a dozen games a year or something like that. It's, we wouldn't even need steam. You know what I mean? We would, just, <laughs> we would have our own steam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and we wouldn't need that because this is as good as anything on there from what I can see anyway. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about like what's involved in like creating something that looks this good? Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of work, <laughs> like a lot. Uh, I mean, okay, so I, I, I have, of course, a lot of experience with game development because I concern myself with it, like ever since I was a teenager. And but whatever, I, I'm not saying like. Um, it's like some arcane knowledge or something like everybody can, especially these days, everybody with like really good tools and really good engines out there. Everybody can just like sit down, go through a bunch of tutorials. You just have to be, it's like with all things, you just have to be consistent. You have to keep learning. And I don't know, in a, in a year or two, you will probably be able to do something that's, you know, like actually create something fun and engaging. If you, if you, if you really like keep up and, and keep it in and, and, you know, like, if you're serious about it um but um yeah i mean the game this game in particular like I'm, i as i said i made my the first game hammer defender i made it pretty much alone except for retro rebel who wrote the soundtrack um <clears throat> and you know i think that's uh, yeah it, it's limited what you can do <laughs> all on your own i mean there are some geniuses out there who make like the most insane stuff alone especially like with, with modern tools like like the modern answer engines are also AI actually is going to be a big factor in that in the future. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I started also with the great rebellion. I started out pretty much alone, uh, except for retro rebel, like the two of us. And initially the whole idea was to just like do the same thing more or less again with a few extra bells and whistles, but just do like hammer defender too. Um, but <clears throat> I've, I found that relatively quickly. I, I thought it's like, you know, boring. I don't want to do the same thing again. And, and then other people started coming to us, like, because they heard of the first game and I guess it, you know, um, it inspired people enough to want to do stuff themselves. And, um, yeah, like, like two or three people contacted me, um, actually from very various backgrounds like there is uh i already mentioned the guy who wrote uh, the 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 text and 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 um we, we, you know worked out the, the 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 background lore with me um he's from from england i don't want to dox anyone but uh yeah and we have you know more and more people from from all over the world basically came to the team teams quite international now we have like people from from England and America and uh, Denmark and yeah, all over Europe. So so it really it grew and and also like the vision changed. Like we wanted to do more, and and we wanted to to go away from from the whole thing being like, um, you know, like 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 as political as if, or maybe you know to be less like um like a bubble in pure in group thing that's like only yeah. for us you know like like only using our references and blah 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 so we want something that is more like universally like just speaks to people and so so the whole thing changed and the gameplay changed you know it turned into a roguelike originally it wasn't supposed to be one 
<clears throat> uh, like uh, the whole thing with the randomly generated levels. I mean, I wanted to do that. It started like maybe a few months after development. I thought, like, okay, I want to do it like that. Um, so it was quite a big decision actually, because I've never done that before. Uh, that was actually kind of scary <laughs> because I, I actually ha had no idea if I could even pull it off because it is definitely more difficult to do than like traditional level design. Um, so yeah, so those were like the, that's what like that was maybe like the, the first half year or so where were was all about like you know forming the team and and um, yeah working out the basic gameplay like what type of game should it even be and what kind of of, of background story wise and and world building wise should it have and so it still kind of has like the DNA basically of this first game um, <clears throat> which was very much of course shaped by my political activism. But it just grew to be much more than that, and um, yeah, we kept working at it. We kept refining it. Um, we have scrapped game mechanics so many times over, and and you know done them in a different way. Um, it was I don't know, maybe not the efficient, the most efficient way to develop a game. We could have probably been faster or something, but like it was very much like. Um, make it up as we go along kind of like lots of improvisation lots of diy because people were joining the team and we had to integrate their ideas or you know their contributions um i mean we had to it was just like they, they brought stuff to the table and it was good ideas so i was like yeah okay we can we can actually do more you know we can actually make this yeah. better um so yeah it was really only let me think I think maybe like like eight eight months ago or so that I really that, that the whole thing really came together that we had like this I guess like this like spring of last year or so was the moment when like okay this is gonna work like like this is actually a good game and then we can pull it off and all of these loose ideas we had in our heads are now coming together and are taking shape and um, it was actually a very <clears throat> it's actually a crazy it's the thing is when you're making a game like a, a lot of uh, like for a very long time it kind of sucks and it kind of is not what you have in your head because the, the thing you have in your head is like far better and you know then but eventually it, it kind of clicks and it, it comes together and you know okay this is not a game and i don't know this is always like a very exciting moment and yeah um the last months we really have just been uh, the last like half a year or so we really have just been uh refining that and making that work um and yeah, I'm not sure if I have answered all your questions, but that is like the the short, uh, um, like yeah, how how the whole thing came together. You know? And no, we are great. now we are now a team of. I mean, I'm still the only guy who does like full time development. Um, we actually have found. Yeah, that's also another. Of course, in the beginning, <clears throat> I had to like find a way to finance this whole thing because it's not. It, I was always. I, it was clear to me that was not something I could do like an, as a side job. So I've. First, we made a crowdfunding campaign, and then we found uh, we found we found people who believed in our project and invested in it. And I mean, the budget we are working with is still like completely laughable com compared to <laughs> what an actual like game game company should have. But, but yeah, I was okay. just saying uh, the the development um, evolution of the project reminded me a lot of making records, actually. Um, where when you sit down with a band um, and you hear what they sound like in you know the jam room or whatever it is, and then you know you get these visions in your head of what it should sound like, what the final product is going to sound like, and of course, you know um, modern mixing and production. There's a lot of you know bells and whistles that you throw on top of it. It's not just a matter of sticking a mic in front of the drum kit and one in front of the singer's face and then calling it a day there's a lot of extra stuff that goes on to make it sound good to make it sound professional um and of course when you do the when you do the bed tracks you know you lay down the initial recordings um you know you do the rough mix and you're like okay well that's that's a rough mix but it's not the final product but you can still kind of hear when, where the final product is going to come um and then it goes through an evolution of you know you you, you do sort of like once you do all the overdubs and you've layered all the extra stuff on top of it, then you do the, the mixing and that is a whole process unto itself. And it evolves through the mixing process. 
And once that's done, you know, once you get it basically as dialed in as you can, uh, you go to the mastering phase, which is kind of like, you know, just um, tidying up everything and making it loud enough. And, and uh, you know, so it basically holds up against professional recordings. And by the end of it, it's like, you know, it's only really in the last few stages where things really start to click and come together. And you're like, oh, okay, this is a record now. <laughs> it's, it's not just like, you know, a, a a jam room demo recording or whatever. Um, but that's, that's not something that you can really hear coming out of the speakers anyway. Um, in the initial stages, it's something that you can hear in your mind's eye, or I guess in your mind's ear. But so what you were saying there about how, you know, initially it doesn't look the way you want. Um, it's, it's still sort of a vision in your head and uh, like in the, it's only in the later stages that that really sort of comes to fruition. That rings very true. And the other thing that reminds me of, um, <clears throat> as far as you know, the, the producing a final product um, was the learning aspect of it, the DIY and sort of getting things wrong, and then you know working through it and all of that stuff. That reminds me a lot of Imperium. So. The first book that we did, which is the Iliad, is about 150,000 words. So this is a pretty thick book. Um, if you were to lay it all out as like text, as like the Iliad is laid out as poetry lines, so it's much thicker as a book than you uh, if it was laid out as paragraphs. But if you laid it out as paragraphs, like any other book, it would be about 400 pages, maybe 450 pages. So it's still a thick book. Um, I read through that thing. I read through that book to proofread it about five times over. So it was a very inefficient process. It was the most inefficient way imaginable, really, to edit a book. Dave's just fucking killing it here on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> He's crushing it. Uh, but um, yeah, it so it, it, it was probably the most inefficient way imaginable to put this book together. And then at, at the end, you know, I was like, okay, I hadn't done this before. I was just, I wanted to make it as good as possible. I wanted to make it stand up against, um, you know, any sort of university publication of that same book. So I added in things like the list of characters. And of course I was like, well, that'll be easy. Well, it turns out that there are like hundreds and hundreds of characters and you have to sort of define who everybody is, the son of so-and-so and, you know, a husband of this person and like, you know, from here and all that. So that took me like about a month. <laughs> um, and you've got, you, you know, you've got to put in all the genealogies, you've got to put in the maps, you've got to put in all the bells and whistles, all this extra stuff. It turned out that like just putting together this one book was like a gargantuan task, like way more than I thought it was going to be initially. And a lot of that really just came down to the fact that I didn't know what I was doing and I was learning as I went along. And so it sounds like you guys had some of that learning curve as well, probably less than I had because I was basically starting from as a noob and you guys have already done this but that's definitely you know the next time you guys make the game make a new game it's going to be you know that you'll have a lot of that stuff sort of under your belt by that point you're listening to an episode of the latest culture dads age of sword and cassette where two fathers and community leaders discuss modern culture from a timeless perspective. Head on over to culturedads.com for podcasts every week.